Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. St. John and the American College of Surgeons for the opportunity to participate uh, in this panel. Evaluation of a neck mass. So when you look at neck masses, they can be either congenital or acquired. And most often they are identified either by visibility or they're palpable on examination or most often really even seen on an imaging study. Now the etiology uh, can be anywhere from infectious, inflammatory, congenital, traumatic, benign, or malignant neoplastic processes. And you see here the relative probabilities of neck mass etiologies. The neck mass in an adult patient, however, has a significantly higher rate of malignancy compared to the pediatric population below the age of 15, where more often than not, it is inflammatory. In fact, it may be the only presenting complaint of a patient with head and neck malignancy. So why is it important? A delayed diagnosis directly affects tumor stage and as a result, worsens the prognosis. Today, in fact, studies continue to report delays as long as three to six months um, in the workup of a neck mass. 50% of neck masses that are uh, persistent can actually be malignant. Now, the overall rate of oropharynx cancer is increasing, and this is despite the lower rates of tobacco use. And this is because of the epidemic of HPV-associated oropharynx cancers that we see. And it's not a stereotypical patient um, with head and neck malignancies. These are non-smokers, um, and hence there is an even uh, more further delay in the diagnosis of these patients with neck masses. Here are some of the traditional risk factors, smoking, alcohol use, age greater than 40 years, immunocompromised status, especially important in skin malignancies, increased number of sexual partners, important for the HPV associated head and neck cancers. Past history of previous head and neck malignancies is important. And then extremely important to ask about head and neck cutaneous lesions and often even lesions that are burnt without being biopsied that could be cutaneous squamous cell cancer. Now the important things to look for are a non-resolving mass like greater than two weeks if it's really not fluctuating um, should be considered um, you know, important uh, for further workup. Evaluate for other head and neck signs and symptoms, voice changes, dysphagia or dinophagia, which is pain on swallowing. Ipsilateral otalgia is an extremely important symptom, and that is because of referred pain from the ninth and 10th nerve. And too often we see people being treated for ear problems when all along it's a head and neck malignancy uh, that is growing. Nasal obstruction or epistaxis, especially if unilateral, uh, should be evaluated. And unexplained weight loss or loss of appetite. On physical examination, a complete head and neck exam should be performed. Inspection for cutaneous lesions. Otoscopy is important because if one has uh, unilateral serous otitis media, often it is obstruction of the eustachian tube from a nasopharyngeal mass. It is not sufficient to just inspect the oral cavity and oropharynx, but palpation is extremely important as very often these malignancies are hidden deep within the base of tongue and in the tonsil. And finally, fiber optic endoscopy and evaluation of the nasopharynx, oropharynx, larynx, and hypopharynx is an extremely important part in the workup of a neck mass for an adult patient. On physical examination, if the mass is fixed to adjacent structures, whether it be the skin, the mandible, deeper muscles, the sternocleidomastoid, or the skull base, those all indicate a higher risk of malignancy. If the consistency is firm, a size greater than 1.5 centimeters, ulceration overlying, on the overlying skin, and any cranial nerve involvement, the hypoglossal nerve or the facial nerve, 
indicates a higher risk of malignancy. Uh, when you palpate these neck masses, it's also important uh, to look for the location of the neck mass. So majority of malignant neck masses really arise from malignancies um, of the head and neck, especially if they are supraclavicular primary malignancies. But 50% of masses in level four or the supraclavicular fossa arise from primary malignancies below the clavicle. But also knowing where the neck mass is, uh, is important in determining where your primary is more likely to be. So example, if you have a submental node, it is likely to be a lip cancer, for instance. If it's a submandibular uh, gland or level one, um, Tri submandibular triangle node, one should think about the anterior two thirds of the tongue, the flow of the mouth, level two can be really from any area of the head, neck, oral cavity, pharynx, larynx, Waldeyer's ring. Uh, posterior cervical nodes can be from the nasopharynx, posterior scalp, ear, temporal bone, or skull base, um, and so on and so forth. So knowing where your malignancy or primary malignancy is likely to be is also based on the level of uh, lymph nodes. In your differential diagnosis, one should look at whether they're benign or malignant, and then identify if it's in the central neck or lateral neck. So the central neck is likely to be benign, thyroglossal duct cyst, thymic cyst, a thyroid goiter, well as malignancies in the central neck can be thyroid carcinoma, lymphoma, thyroglossal duct carcinoma, metastatic carcinoma, chondrosarcoma. In the lateral neck, besides lymphadenitis, branchial cleft cysts, neurofibromas, paragangliomas, um, the malignant neck masses can be either from metastatic carcinoma, salivary gland carcinoma, lymphoma, or sarcoma. So what is the next step after physical examination? Um, the best is to get imaging, a CT scan of the neck with contrast all the way from skull base to the thoracic inlet. And that's probably the first line of investigation for all patients at an increased risk for malignancy. What are the advantages? I think you can localize and characterize not only your neck mass and its relationship uh, to the uh, carotid sheath, or, but also identify your primary neoplasm. You assess for any additional non-palpable mass masses. And you can screen other organs, most notably the upper edge aerodigestive tract that is a potential site of your primary malignancy. It is also important on your scans to rule out other uh, alternative diagnosis, dental disease, granulomas of the lung, apices, salivary calculi, et cetera. Extremely important to use contrast. It should be used unless contraindicated in the evaluation of a neck mass. It enhances soft tissue differentiation, solid versus cystic, better defines the lesion borders, improves detection of your small primary tumors. And you can determine if these are vascular masses and could be a carotid body tumor prior to uh, doing a needle stick. Other imaging modalities um, commonly used the ultrasound. Uh, this is extremely important if you're going to do an ultrasound guided FNA. Uh, it's not recommended though as first line investigation. I, uh, I think it's because it's highly operator dependent. You really can't adequately visualize the upper digestive tract and lack of visualization of some of the deeper structures. Now, MRI um, is used primarily in nasopharynx, salivary gland, or when there are cranial nerve abnormalities to be able to trace uh, the cranial nerves. Um, you do get better soft tissue contrast, but it is more expensive. It's motion artifact dependent, longer scan times, poor availability and really tolerability, especially in uh, patients that are claustrophobic. After you obtain your scans, um, I think the next step, important step is a fine needle aspiration biopsy. Uh, the most important take home message here is that this is more important to do rather than an open biopsy. And we'll talk about this uh, in the next couple of slides. So one, the fine needle aspiration biopsy is accurate, safe and cost effective and has a very low risk of seeding after an FNA. 
In fact, meta-analysis shows the overall accuracy is about 93%, regardless of the anatomical site, with the sensitivity, specificity, positive and negative predictive values noted here. Now, it is a lower sensitivity, especially in salivary gland and in thyroid, but still fairly high, um, and so is a great first step in the workup. Uh, the relative contraindications are vascular lesions, carotid body tumor, anticoagulation therapy. Now, what happens if it's an indeterminate case? The next step is really repeating your FNA with image guidance, either ultrasound or CT guided, so that you can adequately get into the solid components and not the cystic component. If that still doesn't work, then one proceeds to a co-biopsy. A meta-analysis showed the ultrasound-guided core biopsy has a higher accuracy of 95% with low complication rates. It's also probably the first-line tissue sampling for lymph if lymphoma is suspected uh, because the core biopsy sensitivity is 92% versus FNA, which is 74%. However, a negative FNA should not preclude additional diagnostic procedures for a patient if you're suspicious for a malignancy. Now, what happens in a cystic MEK mass, which is more and more common in the HPV era, the overall incidence of malignancy in these masses is only four to 24%. However, in patients greater than 40 years of old, that increases to 80%. Unfortunately, FNA sensitivity is much lower in cystic masses compared to solid masses. Ultrasound-assisted FNA to sample these solid components of the mass is important. If repeat FNA is still inadequate or benign and you're still suspecting a malignancy, that's when one should proceed to an excisional biopsy. With the final aspiration, what are some of the other tests one can perform? Again, in the era of HPV, you have a cystic neck mass, you've got an FNA that's positive for squamous cell cancer. Often you do not find the primary. It could be an unknown primary or a very small primary in the base of tongue. And so sometimes you can do your P16 immunohistochemistry to see if this is an HPV associated tumor on your cell block. Again, nasopharynx is associated with Epstein-Barr and it could stain your cell block for the EB uh, in situ hybridization with EBV and determine that this could likely be a nasopharyngeal primary. And for thyroid malignancies, papillary thyroid, thyroglobulin washout is also helpful in identifying sometimes nodal metastasis. If it's a lymphoma, immunophenotypic analysis for flow cytometry can be performed on the FNA. Um, after all this is done, then one needs to look for the primary. Now, if you're have a negative FNA, but you're still highly suspicious and you're gonna perform an open biopsy of uh, the neck mass. It's extremely important to first start with a pan endoscopy under anesthesia prior to doing this biopsy. During your pan endo, it's important to perform a deep palpation of the pharyngeal wall, tonsil fossa, base of tongue, do a really good nasopharyngoscopy, laryngoscopy, esophagus, and bronchoscopy if indicated. Um, if you still don't find the malignancy, um, you know, and the neck mass turns out to be positive, uh, you want to make sure you have a tonsillectomy or a lingual tonsillectomy. And sometimes this will obviate the need for and potential complications of an open neck biopsy. Now, why do we not recommend an open biopsy without really exhausting all these other measures of FNA, ultrasound guided FNA, doing a pan endoscopy prior to the open biopsy? And this is becoming more common in the HPV area of a cystic neck mass. One um, is open biopsies, risk tumor seeding, and local and regional tumor recurrence. In fact, 7% had tumor deposits in the dermal scars at the time of subsequent neck dissection. More importantly, patients with the violated necks require more aggressive surgery, and often we have to add chemo or radiation because the planes have been violated. One doesn't know if there was extra nodal extension, 
if uh, the neck mass was entered. And this could really change the management of a patient. So our American Academy of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery has a clinical practice guideline, evaluation of the neck mass in adults. And I think it would be really important for everyone to be able to access this information. But here's a, uh, I wanna end with this nice schematic of an adult with a neck mass. So if you have signs and symptoms of a bacterial infection, that of course requires antibiotic therapy. If it resolves, that ends there. However, there's no obvious signs and you're suspicious for a malignancy that we talked about, educate the patient regarding the importance of this could be a malignancy and then perform your history and physical, your scope, good examination of the head and neck. Um, then perform your uh, scans and your needle biopsy. And if your diagnosis is obtained, that's great manage uh, your head and neck malignancy. If no, and the mass is cystic, continue evaluation until the diagnosis is obtained. Do not assume it's not malignant. Um, and again, if the um, neck mass doesn't resolve after antibiotics, then you go back to this path. So um, take home messages, once again, importance of a neck mass in an adult, Please presume it's malignant and work that up in a persistent neck mass. Thank you again uh, to the American College of Surgeons for the opportunity to present. Thank you.